Red Alert, Incoming Airborne in 2021, part one. Martin North, John Adams, Interest of People. Hello, John. Happy New Year, Martin. And to you too. It seems like uh, it's only just uh, over into a new year, but it's the same old, same old. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, great to be back on the show with you uh, and looking forward to uh, doing some very uh, high quality shows on a whole host of topics in 2021. <laughs> um, where I thought would be a good place to start for the year was to actually draw on a couple of shows that you did on Walk the World um, in December. And there, was, and there was something that really caught my eye, and, and we've had a discussion off camera about it. Now, I think in the first fortnight of December, you did a show about um, mortgage stress, and I think the data for November is saying that mortgage stress is at, at an all-time high at about 41.6%, if, if memory serves me correctly. Um, and then rental stress is at an all-time high at about 34 35%. Um, but then you did a show on household um, financial confidence, and confidence had a strong rebound. And then when, and in your program, when you did a granular um, deep dive, what you found is Australians between the age of 40 to 60 who are free affluent, so who own their own home, no mortgage, and who have assets in, in, in the stock market, their confidence has boomed quite significantly because their net wealth is increasing. And so when we had a discussion about, um, you know, that particular cohort, because, you know, uh, I mean, the economy is, is in pretty bad shape. A lot of people are struggling financially, and yet you still have a subsection of Australians whose confidence is rising sharply. And what we discussed off camera was there were going to be effectively two factors that could really impact this boom in household confidence. One is if the share market or if some of these commodity markets or the real estate market was to fall and net wealth was to decline, or if COVID-19 comes back. And... Um, after we had that discussion, I decided to call um, Professor Ted Steele, who came on our last show um, back in May to talk about his series of COVID-19. So I, I had a discussion about uh, this with Ted, and Ted was of the view that um, that COVID-19 would come back in Australia in a couple of waves in 2021. And, and that's what I think uh, today's discussion is about. And so before we get Ted to, to speak, there's just a, probably a couple of graphs that I just want to put on the screen for our audience to have a look at. Um, there's some very interesting things happening with some of this COVID-19 case data. And, you know, whether it's about the economy, debt bubbles, um, real estate prices, the US election, or even COVID-19, um, uh, even before I studied economics, I, I, I was strong in maths in school. I'm always interested in data. And if I see some very interesting patterns in data, then I want to understand what the what those patterns mean. And so the first graph we're going to put up is South Africa. So this is the internationally recognized data. And when you look at South Africa, Martin, you can clearly see that there are two very large spikes in, in the data in terms of cases. Now, if we go to the next slide, we've got Japan. We can see in the Japanese data, there are three large spikes that have happened since the start of the pandemic. And then if we go into our last um, uh, chart, we can see the United Kingdom. Again, we see three large spikes. And so the key question from a science point of view, and, and, and again, I'm an economist, I'm not a scientist, um, so I have no scientific expertise to comment on this, but um, when you look at these explosion in cases, um, and it's not just like a linear growth, we're talking about exponential growth, they seem quite sudden. Um, they happen at different times of the year. So the second wave in Japan was different to the second wave that happened in the United Kingdom. So Japan was around July, whereas the second wave um, in the UK happened around October. Um, now, I, I guess a couple of questions is, well, why is the data behaving this way? Um, I mean, initially we were told this was an, um, this is, was an animal jump from the wet markets. Uh, and then there was a suggestion that it came from a lab where they um, deliberately released or accidentally released. Well, I mean, the, you know, the nature of the virus that we've been told by mainstream scientists doesn't necessarily give a robust explanation as to why we see these sharp exp uh, explosion in cases. Um, um, and, and so because you know, some people may say, well, uh, for example, if you unlock an economy, if you reduce social distancing, if you get rid of a mask mandate, 
if you allow for international travel and, and, and open up the economy, cases are going to come back in. Well, um, that could be, you know, there could be something to be said about in the UK. But, but for example, some of these harsh lockdown procedures haven't been really implemented in Japan. So I'm not sure that scientists or statisticians can categorically say that um, that these explosion in cases that we've seen in these three specific countries that we've just shown is because that control mechanisms have been um, either put on or put off. So, so to my mind, there's uh, perhaps something more interesting in the data that that we that we should. Um, explore um, in, term, in terms of uh, a scientific discussion. That's why Professor Steele has agreed to come back on. But before we um, uh, have him uh, speak, um, any uh, opening comments from you, Martin? Yeah, well, I think it's pretty important, John, to understand that uh, we have what's called a K-shaped recovery at the moment. In other words, there are a proportion of the population doing reasonably well from a financial perspective, particularly if you haven't got a huge mortgage and particularly if you've been invested in the financial markets, right? But there's also another section of the economy that's doing significantly more badly, SMEs, for example, and many people who are renters. And the question, of course, is that whilst everybody wants to get the economy sorted out, until the virus is sorted out, until we've got it under control, um, we're going to see waves and waves of disruption and therefore um, effectively economic distress. And so it becomes ever more critical to try and understand more about this virus, what's driving it and how it might behave so that we can tune accordingly. So I think it's dead right to have uh, Professor Steele back on to get a better view of his perspective on why it's behaving the way it is. Fantastic. All right. And, and, and so why don't we introduce Professor Steele. Professor Steele, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me back on. Excellent. So I, I, you know, the first question I'm probably going to put to you, Ted, is um, we've seen a lot of conversation about the data. Now, we've just presented three graphs that are, that are the international data. So I think they're tabulated by John Hopkins University. And there's, there's you know, a lot of our audience is very skeptical um, about the quality of the data. Um, you know, it could be the frequency of the testing. It could be the PCR test and the uh, and there's allegations of, of, of a, a high false positive. Um, there's allegations that certain ailments have been reclassified. So, for example, influenza in 2020 has plummeted and yet COVID-19 cases has skyrocketed. So um, are we just seeing... Uh, influenza being called COVID-19, or is there something else with that? Um, obviously, there's the, there's a lot of questions around um, the death statistics as well as the the um, the um, the cases, etc. Uh, and then, obviously, when it comes to your area of expertise around analysing genomic sequences, not all the sequences and all of the key locations around the world have been released. So there's incomplete data. There's some, some very big questions about data. And, and in the last 48 hours. Um, even Donald Trump has come out and said that U.S. COVID-19 data has been exaggerated both in cases and then in terms of deaths. So I guess the first question is, is that given that you're a scientist and, and you've been looking, you've been um, pursuing this field for 50 years, how when, when there's so many questions about data integrity and, and, and the quality of the data, how do you start to analyse the science when, when the first is, are you actually looking at accurate information? Well, there's a lot of issues there to deal with, but let me just go through some of the, the first, the overarching ones. How do you deal with those so-called waves that you, the countries you've described, Japan, um, South Africa, and so forth? And uh, you haven't really introduced what, what I was saying, I suppose, earlier in my May, but from our perspective, the the virus, these virus-laden dust clouds, dust clouds are infecting the population from the air. They came in via a meteorite, uh, in late October, sorry, in, in October 2019, and that story is in the previous program. But the point is, it's been it's been caught in the various jet streams, and it's gone east to west through Asia uh, into Italy, Spain, New York, and it's probably kept on that 40 degree north latitude band on several times now, and that's why we're getting multiple infalls. So an infall, so a wave to me is an infall event, not so much a wave in the way we would. I think it looks like a wave in, in, in the plot. Other thing is it's got into the southern hemisphere, so I'm looking at it critically from the point of view of South Africa. South Africa is the harbinger, the canary in the mine shaft for us. Uh, what's happening in South Africa now is even more dramatic than what you described. 
the rise in South Africa in its second wave, but that's its second infall, uh, is exponential. And I view these data uh, from another perspective. I even out all of the technical differences between the countries in their essays and assume that within a region, all that all those technical difference uh, problems will be will be similar with PCR testing and so forth and cases. And so I look at patterns, and patterns are important. Slope of the rise is one very important indicator. And the other part of a pattern is whether it's there's one mode, whether there's one symmetrical shape curve, or whether there are several modes. And if it's a symmetrical shape curve, that, that indicates to me in that region, there's been one general infall of virus from, from the sky. And, uh, and the base of those curves, they're all the same. Everywhere you look, whether it's Victoria, South Africa, Pakistan, any region of the world that's got a symmetrical curve, the base is always two to three months in length from go to woe, and the, and the height varies, and that's probably because of dose and population density of the, of, the, of the target group. But almost certainly dose is the critical factor in many of these places we're talking about because population density is similar, whether it's in Victoria, even in parts of Japan, and in parts of South Africa. So um, that base, that says to me, two to three months is the first thing I look at. That says to me this virus that's coming in the meteorite dust has a decay time of two to three months in the environment. Now, people might want to dispute that with me, but that's the one that lights up all over the world in all regions where there's clearly one symmetrical mode that is one in four. The intensity and the way it goes up depends, I think, is best interpreted most plausibly on the basis of dose coming in. Okay, so they're the, so they're the, they're the two general things that I look at. Now, with respect to all those other issues about... Uh, you know, PCR testing and so forth, they're, they're all very interesting issues. I, I actually agree with Trump that uh, that the that the numbers are all grossly uh, exaggerated. In fact, I agree with Trump on many of his points, but of course, he's been so demonised that it's very hard to use him as your benchmark. But the point is this, the PCR test itself has limitations. I've been working with PCR in my lab, supervising work and analyzing artifacts in many data sets with PCR for many, many years. So I'm a sort of an expert in the PCR technique, but PCR is fundamental to all of the new new generation sequencing and all, that, all the testing that we do in molecular biology at some point uses the, uses the PCR test. And what is a PCR test? I want you to imagine, it's basically a power to logarithmic increase in copy number. <laughs> Just give. Let's let's suppose we have one virus genome, one long thirty thousand base uh, so base genome of a virus, and we subject it to PCR. Just the say or or a, a portion of it, I say it's replicase portion. We and that's what they would normally amplify something like that, and you amplify it up, and it goes through the the twofold series: two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. So after 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 ten cycles duplication cycles, we have a thousand-fold amplification. So if we start off with one virus sequence, say in our test tube, after 10 cycles, we have a thousand copies of that sequence, okay? Now, if we go another 10 cycles to 20 cycles total, that means we'll have a million copies of that of that a sequence in our test tube. So that's what it's based on. It's a two-fold logarithmic amplification test. Now, <clears throat> So it's very sensitive. Now, the more cycles you have, obviously, the more copies you're going to get, but the more cycles you have also means you're going to run the risk to almost certainty to at some point of amplifying anything and getting a false false positive. I won't go into the technical reasons for that, but that's, that's, a, that, that's a fact. So experts use PCR or should be using PCR very, very carefully. And we should be appending a cycle number beside each positive PCR test. So when we get a PCR test that's positive, we'd like to know, is that a low cycle number or a high cycle number? If it's a high cycle number, say 50, 20 or so cycles, it could be an artifact, false. If it's a low, positive, if it's a low cycle number, it could be very, very meaningful. It says there's a high concentration of virus particles in that swab that's been taken from your nose and you lute it into that saline tube that they were diluted into. So, all right. So if, if, if the number of cycles is not being reported, now you said that some of the data is being exaggerated, for example, in America, but, mm -hmm. but even with exaggeration, you're looking at patterns. How do you know that the patterns you're looking at are actual rule patterns as opposed to manipulated data? 
No, because I look at other many countries and I see these patterns, these broad trends. That's why it's opened up with the broad uh, patterns. Uh, the trouble is in America, we have special problems. We have, first of all, many more testing in the United States than anywhere else. It's comparable to Victoria's over, over, over testing or New South Wales. Um, um, we, have, we have also political and scientific chaos in the United States at the moment. The uh, doctor, doc, Dr. Fauci is, is a, a super spreader of misinformation, but sometimes he, get it, he gets it right too. Uh, he got it right on PCR number. He actually said a couple of days ago that we should be looking at PCR number. Well, I couldn't, you know, a cycle number, I couldn't agree with him more. It's like your glucose test that you get from your blood numbers. You want to know whether it's in the, the normal range or not, or above or below it. Well, with a cycle number, if it's low, and I, let's say 10 to 15 cycles, that's probably a real positive result. Anything above that, you're starting to get into the, into the zone of false positive. So that's there are lots of technical issues that are not being addressed openly with the with the public on the PCR test. But the other one is even more serious. Dr. Burks, the White House medical uh, person, made an absolute <laughs> crazy proclamation that any COVID death, any death with a COVID positive signal would be considered a COVID death. She actually said that in the White House press conference right at the start of the of the campaign at the White House. Now, that hasn't been erased, I think. I've, and all the anecdotal evidence I have, I'm listening, watching all the stuff on the net, is that that's probably being implemented willy-nilly everywhere. So this is how I handle, now getting back to your point, how do I handle these numbers? Well, uh, there are a lot of uh, asymptomatic or very mild cases of COVID. So I double the case number by two. I just double the number. So if the cases say it's 20,000 a day, I would say that's probably 40,000 a day. And then I look at the death number, which is also in the same charts from, from Johns Hopkins or, or similar facilities that are putting it out. And I'd say, well, that, that bottom number, particularly in the United States, and probably everywhere is a bit rubbery, but particularly in the United States, and I'd divide it by two. If you just do those two corrections in your head, you can actually analyse all the data around the globe and you arrive at the following incredible number. It's all the same everywhere, everywhere you look, including the hysterical claims in the UK and California right at, you know, right at the moment. And that's this number. The number is about 0.1 to 0.2% of all COVID cases die. And we know that the death rate is restricted to you know, elderly people. In Victoria, it's 84 years old. That's, but we know there's a very small group that are vulnerable to it. And that small group have no immune defences. So when, why is that number important, 0.1 to 0.2%? Well, it turns out that if you look at the total, I've got on my wall here, the total deaths through 2019 or 2020 in the United States for all causes and divided by the population, you come, you come out of a figure about one in a thousand, which is that is one COVID, one COVID death per thousand of population. So that's a number of about of the order of 0.1%. So that my supposition that most most people have been exposed to COVID-19 in the United States is probably true. That is, the actual cases are enormous. So the point I'm trying to make is that the vulnerable population are immune defenceless elderly comorbids. If they're not looked after carefully and intelligently, they could die. Unfortunately, we saw that in Victoria repeatedly. It got it got repeatedly demonstrated to us in Victoria because we had super spreaders send, spreading the same virus between nursing home and aged care facilities, and they all went up like all went up in flames. And it was just terrible to watch and witness. Now, I just want to say that I handle the numbers that way, right? And from my perspective, the death rate numbers are still extremely low, it, despite the hysteria about the UK and California. That stuff each night on TV is just pure rubbish as far as I'm concerned. Now, getting back to openness of data, the United States, because of the chaos, is also pretty transparent. Like, for example, many of the sequences that I'm interested in analysing are already uploaded in the United States to GenBank and therefore onto NCBI virus. The UK has, not hardly, has hardly released anything. It's totally opaque. In fact, the pronouncements coming from their medical officers are not only opaque, they're hysterical and they're alarmist. And Boris Johnson now is captive to a cabal of biomedical scientists and epidemiologists and policymakers who are completely way off the, way off the planet. They're going to destroy the United Kingdom, I think. We've got a similar set of people like that here in Victoria. 
but but at least in Victoria, they've uploaded a significant number of genomes. They've uploaded 12,000 genomes of the first and second wave, and I've now haplotyped them all. I know I, I can make that public, confidently make that public uh, announcement. I've haplotyped them all, but there's a huge gap in the data, and I know that from all the numbers that the Herald Sun published every day for a month and a half. The mystery cases, the community transmissions. I would expect to see them in the data in a, with a particular type of pattern, and they're not there. The Victorian government, Doherty Institute, probably all those involved in the and the Department of Health and Community Services here in um, Victoria are withholding that information and not releasing it. They're making public claims all the time, and I can't check it. Uh, my analysis of Victoria would be complete if I had all of those mystery cases. Now, in our last interview, you basically said that COVID-19 was, if it, from, from a DNA perspective, effectively the common cold or something very close to the common cold. Uh, do you still hold that view? And well, has there any, has anything happened in your research over the last sort of eight, nine months that may give you a new perspective on what, what is this virus? Well, well, I, don't know, I, wouldn't, I didn't make that deduction necessarily from the, the sequences, but I would let's make it from the point of view of its impact on the population. And it's still, yeah, of course I stick by that. But that's why I went through those numbers. It's still a common cold virus, which is very, very deadly for elderly immune defenseless comorbids. No innate immunity. That is no first line 24 hour defense, which knocks most of these viruses out of the, out of the, out of the ring before they even get, even get going. Healthy people have it, but elderly comorbids don't have that barrier. So even a very small dose of virus, uh, getting into that community would go like, and once it once it ignites in one patient, it just blossoms in that patient. There are virus particles everywhere, and they'll, be, they'll just get spread throughout the institution. It's just a disaster. So no, I haven't changed my view on on that at all. And I sure. think all, the, all of the hard data support my view. Yeah. Um, now, now, when we did our last interview, Ted, uh, I think you said that you were you were in the process of uh publishing um a or putting together an important scientific paper yes. you were doing some research and you found um some behavior about the virus which was uh your your your, your discovery was quite unique now since we last spoke in may you've published your paper it has been peer-reviewed it mm. has been published in a scientific journal mm. can you sort of bring us up to speed with with what you, what did you publish and what did you find about the virus that other scientific researchers missed well, we analysed the, the available sequences from Spain, New York, compared with Wuhan, and we found that you could analyse the data and make sense of all of the sequence data if you if you could if you classed uh, the different variants you saw as haplotypes. Now, what's a haplotype? A haplotype are a group of changes. We, we've got say thirty thousand bases or thirty thousand letters in the virus code, and two, three, or four changes from the reference sequence that you know that hit Wuhan they define a haplotype so when I talk about a haplotype like uh, L241A that's three changes from the Wuhan sequence that's all three change, changes the simple analogy so people can try and understand it in their in their head is as follows imagine that the long string of the virus is a Chinese noodle right <laughs> in China it's a Chinese noodle and the and, and it has it's floppy but the but when it when that when that same raw virus wants to replicate, say, in a Caucasian, or a Latino, or an African American, in New York City, some of that some of those changes have to change it to turn it from a, a floppy sort of noodle to a uh, say a more stiffened stiffened piece of spaghetti. Let's say the virus in the host parasite relationship is trying to find the correct set of changes to give the appropriate secondary structure for the virus to replicate in that biochemical background or that genetic background. So when the virus comes into a, a multicultural community, the raw virus, you will get a spray of successful haplotypes generated, ab, ab initio, that is, in the first infection. So the, the signature of the virus coming into a multicultural community will be haplotype diversity. When it comes into a fairly homogeneous, genetically homogeneous population or cultural population, it may very well be quite restricted, like it is in China. Now, we've since used those set of haplotypes to analyse all of the all of the haplotypes that came into Melbourne through January to March. It's, it's robust. We can we can tell from what part of the world they came from, or France. I've since used that same set of haplotype 
uh, combinations to analyse uh, Florida, and I've used the same set you now to analyse Victoria first wave through second wave. It's a robust set of haplotypes, markers, haplotype markers. But the key thing is this. Mystery cases, by and large, are going to show haplotype diversity. If you get capricious amplification of one of those haplotypes in a nursing, a nursing home, for example, or an aged care facility, you're going, to get clone, you're going to get clonality. You're going to get amplification of the same haplotype, just like in a Petri dish, uh, you know, culturing a clone of, of a virus or a, as you would in, in, the, in, in the lab. So the mystery cases and haplotypes are intrinsically linked. And that's why I want to see all the mystery cases in Victoria. I expect them to be incredibly diverse. July, August, September, they're all one haplotype in Victoria. I know that. I've done the whole 6,000 of them. It's just one haplotype. It doesn't make sense. There's sure. a whole set of missing data that the Herald Sun tells me exists, 4,100 of them. Obviously, we've been told that this is a virus that is spreading person to person. Your thesis with your group of international researchers is saying that COVID-19 is an airborne contaminant that came from an asteroid strike. Yes, that's right. Um, um, and, and so um, when we get these outbreaks in Australia and the government and the health authorities do contract tracing, they're trying to find the source. And whether it's in this new cluster in the northern beaches in New South Wales or some of these uh, uh, clusters that happened in, in Melbourne in uh, starting from August of 2020, uh, when they did the contact tracing, they couldn't. In some cases, they couldn't find where the saw, where the virus originated from, and this is what they define as a mystery case, where they can't identify the source. Now, your claim is the source is it's come from the air, whereas the government is still scratching the head, saying um, uh, we don't know what where this virus came from. But look, I actually agree that Daniel Andrews and in New they've all got their contact tracing down pat, perfect. I believe every single claim they make about when they make the first public statement about it, when they when they find a mystery case, an untraceable mis mystery transmission where they can't find the person that that gave it to that person, that is a genuine mystery case. There's lots of them in Victoria. There's over four thousand of them, and in the most recent infalls, there's another bunch of them. The point is this: <clears throat> they really are very very important. But what happens is, there's a, a uh, this is why it's important to discuss them. As the conversation goes on about mystery cases, they, you'll find a cluster here or a cluster there. And if they find a new case that's initially a mystery, they can't categorise, but then they find, oh, it's got a haplotype that's vaguely like that cluster, or this person met somebody who went through that cluster, they draw a tenuous link. And what happens over time, some of these mystery cases disappear by those tenuous types of arguments. But... There is a still a rump in Victoria. I know this because I've got all the copies of the Herald Sun for a month and a half. There's a rump of mystery cases, 4,100, which were never resolved. They're just forgotten about. Now, that the outbreaks recently in Sydney, by, by the way, to answer your question, how are we going to COVID kind of come back in 2021? It's already come back. We've got an outbreak. We've got infalls in New South Wales and Victoria. They're all small. Every one of them is a mystery case, except when they've got a, a cluster and then they start changing, you know, using words to describe a member of a, of a cluster. But all the original, original cases, whether they're in Victoria or New South Wales, are all genuine mystery cases. The contract tracing is very, very good here. And why is it very good? You know, why aren't they doing this overseas? Well, they can't. The northern hemisphere now is saturated with viral genomes. There are tens and twenties of 30,000 a day. In many regions, there's viral genomes and viral proteins everywhere, saturating everything, exposed food, the environment, the whole environment's contaminated in the northern hemisphere. But it's still small enough down here in Australia for us to contact trace because, uh, you know, and genuinely say that is a mystery case. So all of these, all of these Patient X, there's a lot of patient X's out there. You know, the, the Black Rock Cafe in the southern beaches of, uh, eastern beaches of uh, Melbourne suburbs, or the Avalon Beach clusters and so forth in New South Wales. All those people are mystery cases. They're all patient X's, right? <laughs> Let's get the point. But the mystery cases there, I bet you, are diverse in haplotype. I'd like to see those haplotypes. Similarly, I'd like to see the haplotypes here in the southern beaches and beach suburbs in Port Phillip Bay here in Melbourne. I'd like to see those haplotypes. I doubt whether we're ever going to see them because if they're withholding 4,100 already, they're not going to let the others out because 
you know, now, <clears throat> the next is raised, why would they want to hold on to them? They, they don't want them to divulge them because to a conventional person-to-person -person thinker building a perfect, you know, Darwinian tree with branches, their data are uninterpretable. But they can't interpret the data if they're all different haplotypes. Now, on the first program, I said to most people it would look like a mangrove swamp. Well, it does. It looks like an uninterpretable mangrove swamp to these people looking at these, this data. So that's why the data have never been uploaded. Um, one of the things that, um, just in terms of mystery cases, which, which caught my eye, um, and, uh, you know, and I know that other scientists have looked at this as well, we've seen in 2020 uh, a few examples of ships leaving docks around the world. The crew is COVID-19 free. Mm. And then once they're out into sea, for several days or weeks, all of a sudden, a large number of the crew start to get sick with COVID-19. Now, um, I know that with uh, your colleague in the UK, Chandra Wickrung Singer, when he did his analysis with, with Francis Hoy about the Spanish flu, uh, and, and obviously in 1918, 1919, this was before air travel, the same phenomena was also being witnessed 100 years ago of ships out to sea, no contact with land, all of a sudden, um, large number of crew falling down with the Spanish flu. 2020, we were seeing a large number of people out at sea falling, uh, all of a sudden, um, uh, getting sick with COVID-19. So, so, so that is, again, another scientific anomaly, which, which gives me some confidence as a non-scientist to believe that maybe COVID-19 is an airborne contaminant, and that obviously changes the whole interpretation and of, of, of the virus and how we respond to it so um what do you what do you have to say about uh, ships at sea all of a sudden getting crew falling sick with COVID-19 so you're actually touching on the on the, the key point now the, the epidemiologists senior immunologists in Australia the chief medical officer and the pilot have got the completely wrong infection model in their head I think we've made that clear up until now right I think it's pretty clear now they've got the wrong infection model but ships at sea are the case which should cinch it in most logical people's minds should cinch the deal it's amazing it hasn't fred hoyle and wick ramasangi documented numerous cases like this of ships at sea but prior to even them in the 18th uh, in the 18th century there were many examples of you know sailing ships going down all of a sudden with influenza out in the middle of the ocean now getting coming to the present Let's just deal with the present situation. There are many examples of COVID. All ships at sea are vulnerable to COVID because they're going to go through multiple potential clouds because they're travelling or patches of sea spray that's contaminated. So deckhands on fishing trawlers, on big ships are going to be particularly vulnerable, those that are out all the time on the you know, ex exposed to it. Now, in every case that we've looked at with ships at sea, They've all come down with it. That's why the cruise industry is, I'd say, on its last legs. There's no way the cruise industry can now, in an era of pandemics, reliably go to sea thinking that they're going to be free of anything that comes in from the air. They can't be. That's the first thing. Secondly, the LQ-8 sheep ship is a, we describe it in two of our papers as, uh, with Dr. Herbert Rebrand. He was the veterinary surgeon on the ship. Let me just describe what he saw. It, in May... It came, the ship came back empty from Kuwait. All the crew that got on the ship were all COVID negative. Everyone was tested, they were all negative. They got on the ship, bringing the ship back without any sheep on, right, to pick up another load in a Fremantle. When they got, when they were about a week out from Fremantle, they, there was a little bit of a sudden, something happened on the ship, quite, you know, within the space of 24 hours. Of some of the crew members reporting some sniffles or a mild flu, and the captain, the Croatian ship's captain, I, I mentioned the racial here because all of the ship decks, all the crew members were Filipino. Herb Remeron is an Australian American, and the and the people locked away in the cabin up right at the top of the ship were Croatian, right? All the officers, so they were all in different locations in the in, in the ship. The crew members on the deck were out were exposed to the ocean elements all all the time, most of the day. Now, all of the crew, there were 21 Filipino crew, all of them had mild to nothing. And the ship's captain, to be just to be careful, said, look, we don't have a doctor on board, and, and, and asked Reb to, if he could just check them out. He was a veterinary surgeon, so he actually had a bit of medical knowledge. He checked them out, and uh, some of them had a slight stiffle, 
Many didn't. Some said they had a little slight, slightly tired, but nothing remarkable. So he, he made a blanket decision. Uh, his decision was, well, some of them might have an early flu, and if they've got a flu, I'll prescribe antibiotics for them because that's a very good precautionary thing to do to, you know, to suppress the bacterial infection that might occur if you've had a viral infection. And they all recovered. They all got back and they were all sprightly. And a week later, they get back in, uh, you might remember the incident, it was in the news on the ABC and the Australian, but a minor story. They get back in Fremantle and to the shock horror of everybody, the whole, all, all the crew were COVID-19 positive. Now, you could have, Herb Reverend, when he found that out, he couldn't believe it. He couldn't believe, and, and, and he was negative. All of the officer class were negative, except the deck crew. How do conventional scientists uh, <laughs> or conventional medical officers, how, how do all of a sudden well, people on ships well, getting COVID-19? Yeah, short answer to your question is they can't explain it by conventional person to person unless they say it all came in by contaminated goods. But the trouble is that story repeats it feels also on that, uh, that Argentinian uh, Fishing trawler, same story, all checked out, went out. 35 days later, they all come back and all of the crew have got COVID-19. And they couldn't work it out. They got it at sea. The the, the isolated, uh, recently, last week, the isolated Chilean army base in, the, in, in, in Antarctica, 58 members at the base and the supply ship, which was in the bay, all got it at the same time. This is just a week or so ago thousands of kilometres from civilization. Now, another big mystery case at sea was the USSS Theodore Roosevelt on operations in May in the North Pacific. You might have heard about it. Large, there was a large outbreak on board. Over 1,100 crew on that aircraft carrier went down with COVID-19. Okay, and it shocked everyone. I've read the paper in the New England Journal. They described the data but very, very dishonestly. It was written by a group of naval medical officers at a research institute outside Maryland who reported it in the New England Journal of Medicine. All they did was, was PCR tests, that is the fragment tests, not the full genome tests, so, so you can actually turn out what, figure out what the haplotype is. Yet at the Maryland base, where there was a similar, at about the same time, outbreak of COVID in the United States, you know, in a land-based, Navy institution, they had an outbreak, look, looked like it spread quickly, person to person, and they did genomic sequencing of all of those and reported them in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, I wrote to the, it's just crazy stuff, I wrote to the lead author of the Theodore Roosevelt study and said, can you please tell me where the genomic sequences are for all of, the, all of these cases, the 1100? Because they're all mystery cases, right? Well, I couldn't get through to him. The email address published in the New England Journal of Medicine paper is a bogus email address. It's you can't. It's uncontactable. So I then tried to penetrate the Navy defences by multiple emails in through other routes, through the info office or through other authors in the list and finding their email and asking them to pass it on to the lead author. Could they please let us know what's happened to all the genomic sequences? Nothing. Dead silence. It's the same as my inquiries I made to the, the Doherty Institute about the Victorian first wave. Complete silence. Modern science is broken. Can't you see what's going on? This normally should not happen. I'm a scientist. I expose all my ideas and data to public scrutiny. And if you, if you publish in the New England Journal of Medicine, then you should make the data available for the population of other scientists to examine. They're not doing that. Now, why are they must have the genomic sequences? Why must they have the genomic sequences? Well, because it's the Navy, it's the US Navy. They want to know what the genomic sequence was that took out 1,100 of their crew. Suddenly, it happened suddenly, by the way, too, on the aircraft carrier. When you hear of isolated ships at sea all of a sudden falling ill to COVID-19, uh, what, what sort of is running through your mind? I mean, it seems to me a bit of a statistical anomaly given what we've been uh, told by the, the mainstream media about what this virus is. Oh, absolutely. Look, every ship that gets... Now, let, let me just come in there for a second. Um, yeah, so f for me, you know, this is an important observation about the scientific method, right? Because to my mind, the scientific method is you create a hypothesis, right? And then you test that hypothesis to see whether the findings meet the hypothesis. Yes. Right. That is the yeah. fundamental way Absolutely. that science works. Now, your hypothesis, Ted, 
is mm. it's airborne, right? Mm. And the mm. data that you've been presenting would seem mm. to validate very strongly that hypothesis, bearing in mind that the other people who are also publishing with a different set of hypotheses seem to be tripping over themselves. Yes, it's right? hilarious to watch. As well as testing the sites for, of these people and all these clusters, whether it be at Avalon Beach or the Black Rock Cafe or anywhere else, the environment should be being tested and swabbed at the same time <laughs> in all these surprising outbreaks. That is surface water, leaves, the fur of pets and dogs, out, uh, clothes hanging on the line, railings, car doors. We should be swabbing the environment, not all the people that somehow haphazardly got caught up in visiting the Black Rock Cafe, you know, in South Brighton or Mentone. So, look, uh, I... I um, so that should be part of the screening process now. Environmental contamination should be part of it. Whether the one in Wollongong, the Blue Mountains, the Croydon, all of these clusters, right? We heard about them. They're all mystery cases. The environment of that area should be swabbed, not not sterilised, because they all say they're going to put the sterilisers through. Before you do that, just swab it and get an idea what the environmental contamination looks like in that environment. Uh, that would be very important, significant information. That's another test, as Martin said, of the hypothesis. Now, there was an important recent study at the University of Flora which caught my attention, and because it was doing the rounds of social media, where they went through. Uh, I mean, they, they effectively looked at about fifty or sixty independent studies, and they did a, a, a complex statistical analysis, mm -hmm. and they couldn't find any evidence of. Uh, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic spread. So obviously we've been told throughout the last 12 months that uh, 50, in, in any, in, in, depending on the circumstances, it could be between 50 to 70% of people with COVID-19 are asymptomatic, but that asymptomatic um, condition could, could result in um, human transmission. Now, some scientists at the University of Florida has said, well, there is no evidence of asymptomatic spread. Um, or or pre or pre symptomatic spread, um, and that obviously, if that is true, given that fifty to seventy percent of these explosion cases are asymptomatic, I mean that that again tells us that uh, you know it, it can't be human to human spread. It, it, it you know it, it lends towards a different idea and potentially airborne um, an airborne contaminant. So uh, on this University of Florida study. Um, do you have any sort of observations about what they did and what they found? That study you talk about is incredibly rich. I've filed it, lots of studies, uh, really hard to get my head around all of them, so I can only pick, pick the eyes out of it. And there were some clear cases of uh, in, in New York where I was most interested, you know, during the height of the epidemic there in March. There were, there were households that all members of the household had it, then there are other members of the house that were just the program had it, no one else. Really crazy jackpot stuff. But Hoyle and Wick Ramasanghi described a lot of that in their uh, in their in their analyses of flu. But the other point about asymptomatic generally, and mild, uh, and you know those with mild infections as a general rule, whilst that may be generally true that they not appear to be spreading it to other. <laughs> Healthy people, they may not, because healthy people, as I say, get rid of this virus pretty, pretty quickly. But you get a person like that that's got it either on their ch goods and chattels or on their clothes or they're mildly infected. You get them into a, a, a group of immune defenseless, elderly comorbid people, the virus will certainly spread person to person then in that community. And we saw that here in Victoria. You know what, the most outrageous thing in Victoria, and it's not blaming any particular person, it's just a general structural policy, was the multiple numbers of low wage earning women carers that had to work in many different institutions, right, who were probably, almost, well, were inadvertently spreading the virus. You know, they had a mild infection. They were spreading it to all the other nursing homes. That's why we've got, we've, we're seeing the same haplotype in all of the aged care facilities in Victoria. The same haplotype, the only model that fits it's just the model I've described, and the, you know, the care, the mildly infected, asymptomatic carers are actually spreading it. By the way, when you get into those institutions, it's not just the elderly, the immune defences that get it in, w when it goes off like that in an institution like that, but all the other carers get it, and all the medical staff get it. In fact, you look at the numbers that are published routinely in the Herald Sun about that, then it's roughly 50-50. Half the cases reported on a day are inpatient, the other half are, are, are all in the staff. So 
There's no doubt about it. It does spread. So from a, a mildly infected, asymptomatic person, if you get into that environment, it will spread. As we started this interview, when we looked at some of these uh, countries like Japan, UK or South Africa, where you see these huge explosions, um, I mean, that 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 can't be explained. If, if the majority of these cases are asymptomatic and most of these people are not in closed environments, mm. uh, I mean, what I understood from this study was... Um, a lot of it, a lot of this can't be explained through human to human transmission. Oh, yeah. There must be some other explanation. Yeah, I, I agree with that, except that we, living in Victoria, we watched the, this particular spectacle of what actually happened here, and I, you know, I just finished doing me six thousand or so genomes for that period, and they're all the same. Happened. I was just staggering. I've just seen everything like it else in the world. It looks like a one set of petri dishes all cross infecting each other and all coming up with the same appetite it's extraordinary it's pretty clear i think we're getting from from your last interview ted in this interview is, is that because your view is that science mainstream scientists and 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 the, and the and the medical professionals have misunderstood the nature of the virus the response to the virus has been catastrophically wrong and this is where i guess martin and i have been talking about it in terms of the financial sense and obviously we see huge financial hardship you know and economic destruction because uh, of the lockdown uh, and then obviously there's the, there's mental health social there's a, the, there's all sorts of other implications from that but i guess the, the one question is did someone actually get the response to the virus right in 2020 Sweden is now the poster poster country for getting it getting it right it was derided uh, unmercifully for six or seven months as getting it wrong but they got it right another country that got it right is pakistan uh, jeremy beck one of your people on your wider you know he got in touch with me and then he analyzed pakistan brought it to my attention he did right pakistan had a beautiful symmetrical curve uh, then the background the backstory to pakistan is really interesting before the epidemic hit pakistan uh, President Imran Khan, to his great credit, had to make a decision about lockdowns for his country, millions of people in his country. And he publicly said, I'm not going to allow millions of people in my country to starve. We're not going to lock down. We're just going to live. We're going to ride it out. We're going to ride this common cold, well, this virus out. We're going to live with it. And, we, and you know what? They've it's over now. Uh, it was quite high considering the country. You know, the peak was 6,000 cases a day. But then again, it's a big country, a lot of people. But they've got one clear and it's over. They may get another info, but the point is they, they've they handled it without killing millions of their people. Because, see, a lockdown in a country like that, a poor country like that, would be devastating. But in Pakistan's interesting in the sense that they started locking down and, 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 then, and, then, and then the uh, and, and while the cases were going up, and then, like you said, the Imran Khan decided to unlock. Yeah. And then after they unlocked, the cases went down. And yes. Pakistani scientists were saying, well, we don't understand why. Because <laughs> the convention is if you unlock, cases are supposed to explode. Yeah. But their cases actually went down. And this was a, a statistical anomaly that Pakistan yes. couldn't explain. In Victoria, the lockdown had zero impact on the course of the second wave. Of it. Zero. Not a little bit. Oh, you know, a bit. Nothing. It had absolutely no effect. It was like every other lockdown in the world, no effect on the, on, the, on the course of the virus. Yet the government here and the medical profession are all cheering Victorians on for, for beating the virus and getting through it, when it's absolutely nauseating to watch because it had no impact. The hard lockdown occurred right at the middle, right at the peak of the second wave, and you would have expected to change the course of the infection on the you know on the right hand side of the curve that is as the as it, it had no impact the right hand side is a mirror image of the left hand side of the curve okay it's a symmetrical curve it had no impact no one was listening you know you know i sent that around to a lot of people in my email broadcast no one was listening to it. i sent it to daniel andrews i sent it to brett sutton no didn't want to know about it you and I have had a bit of a contentious back and forth, both on and off camera, about Sweden. I think you've been slightly critical. I, I think I said in one of our shows last year that by August, the WHO were against lockdowns because they said publicly that the cost was outweighing the benefit. But, but And I think you were su perhaps suggesting that maybe early on around March, April, that, that lockdowns were perhaps justified given the information available. I guess... 
Um, you've been critical of Sweden. The Professor Steele has said that Sweden had got it right. I mean, did you have, I guess, any comments or any questions about the Swedish model? And I mean, feel free to challenge to Professor Steele. <laughs> I don't know enough to be able to argue it either way, John. What I would say is that it's clear to me that there are complexities in what's going on which the standard models that people have been trying to use to explain it aren't actually effectively explaining, right? And therefore, if in fact the fundamental basis on which decisions are being taken, that's political decisions and financial decisions as well as health decisions, are actually based on incorrect hypotheses, and then you're going to end up with weird outcomes. And I would argue that we're definitely ending up with weird outcomes, but I don't know enough to know whether, um, you know, Sweden was right, Sweden was wrong. All I can say is that the physical cost and the financial cost and the social costs of the lockdowns, as they continue to be turned on and turned off, look at the UK now, are huge. And if indeed the fundamental assumption underlining the way that the virus is being tackled is incorrect, then that's a big deal. Well, look, I have to agree with you. It's a big deal. The origin and global spread of COVID-19 always was the big deal for me because the downstream sequelae of the wrong interpretation... Look at look at how they, the mistakes compound themselves and multiply. Uh, I really feel in a, terrible for the UK right now. I think Boris has been captured, as I said, by uh, totally... Uh, well, almost totalitarian biomedical and epidemiological class who have no idea what they're doing. They simply have the completely wrong infection model in the head. He's been captured by it. And I really fear for the, for the United Kingdom now, more so than Victoria. Because on small scale, we've had the same treatment in Victoria. Like Victoria and the UK are the extreme outliers in the way they treat their populations. You know, it's comparable with Wuhan, China. It's just extraordinary to actually watch it and to let alone live through it. And so, you know, for me, I want to tell you, for me, I dread going out. I don't want to get arrested. I have to wear a mask. <laughs> really, that's the reason I wear the mask. I'm wearing the mask now, the last few days, because of the weather, and I know it's been coming in again, and just as a precaution, because I'm 72, going on 73, so I'm in the range that might go down with it. So I'm, I'm using it in a sensible way, and I also have my decontamination area at the front of the flat again, so I get all my clothes off. <laughs> leave them there, have a shower, and then get into other clothes, right? So I don't contaminate the house if I've rubbed again. But look, I'm taking to it, taking it to extreme. I'm not necessarily recommending other people do, but uh, but the fact of the matter is that the the dictums on, on the lockdown are very, very destructive and they've had no impact. I'd like to show you the curve. For, we, maybe next time we can show you. It's, it's there. It's a symmetrical curve, uh, John and Martin. Of, of you know, If you look at the symmetrical curve, the R squared is 0.899. It's had no impact whatsoever. The stage four lockdown right at the middle had no effect. Now, come on. How much more data do you need? But then Luskin, you know, Don Luskin in the United States, uh, you know, he did all those regional studies of all the lockdowns, came to the same conclusion that lockdown hasn't worked anywhere on the course of the virus. Senator Rand Paul summarised the data in the Senate and he went through all of the cases where lockdown and he said the virus has a mind of its own. It has had no impact at all. The lockdowns have had no impact on the way this virus has run through a population. Mm -hmm. So, look, it's not just me saying it. Other people who have looked at similar data sets are saying the same thing. Right. But, Ted, there's another implication, isn't there? If it is airborne and it continues to circulate, mm. then we are going to get more waves ahead, right? Well, we just hope that it washes all down. But, you know, you're asking a critical point. How long is it going to take to wash down? Radioactivity tracer experiments and volcanic eruptions, when they get into the same stratospheric winds, you know, stratospheric winds, um, they, they could be two years. Spanish flu 1819 took... Two years to run its course, but then it never really came back, you know, the way it did. Uh, SARS-1, 2002, was restricted to Southeast Asia, never came back. But it takes ages for, for the big ones to come down. So, you know, we're really at the mercy of whether, whether it's all, all come down or not. And I can't predict that. I just, I just, I can only interpret after the event of when something happened. Ted and uh, John, I mean, I found this um, a very disturbing conversation today, not least because what it does underscore is how the scientific process has effectively been scrambled um, at a very critical time. So, Ted, thank you very much for sharing those insights with us and our audience. And I think there are going to be some very interesting 
and concerning discussion to have following that in terms of the implications ahead. But uh, in terms of today, John, I think that was a very important chat. Yeah, I was going to say thank you, uh, Professor Steele, for coming. And uh, Martin, just to let our audience know, so this is part one. We're going to come back in part two in our next show to talk about COVID-19 in 2021 and, and what we think that future forecast is going to look like. Yeah, John. Well, I look forward to that. And uh, Ted, thank you very much for your time today. It's Martin North, John Adams and the Interest of the People. We'll see you next time. <laughs>